Good morning uh, to everyone. Hello to all. Uh, my name is Katarina Fortun, and uh, I will guide you, walk you through the session today. So we have uh, the space uh, of 45 minutes um, where we will listen to Greg, our expert um, uh, from the EIB. And indeed, Greg, uh, he has a, an experience in urban development. He's a senior urban sector specialist uh, in the European Investment Bank. And um, he will tell us, uh, yeah, I, I, I leave the content to, to him because I think it will be very passionate uh, presentation on our biggest challenge, which is the climate adaptation and resilience and how can we become uh, a, the European uh, climate resilient uh, continent uh, by 2050 and what we need in terms of financing. I work uh, as a policy analyst, uh, so I see it from a different angle uh, within the Commission, uh, within the Directorate General of DG Klima. Uh, I work on the climate adaptation mostly and uh, with cities, so I'm responsible uh, to support the covenant of mayors, uh, the cities, the municipalities, what they need. So I'm also really uh, curious, uh, Greg, to hear what is there for cities, what is there for municipalities. We got really good hints and uh, good information uh, from the previous se uh, session from Germany. Uh, so let's see what is there at the European level from the European Investment Bank to all member states. Uh, that could also inspire the structure at national level and regional level. And I also have experience from the uh, cohesion funds in the past. Uh, so I would be happy to see how to combine also the structural funds and uh, the new generation funds, uh, the EU funds also from Horizon Europe, uh, how to combine it with private investment. And my questions would be also after, of course, your presentation, but uh, how can the EU or public funds uh, actually trigger uh, or guarantee the private investment? So how can we trigger the private investment, the bankers to really invest in adaptation in the societal transformation? Formation. I'll also uh, remind a bit uh, the rules. Uh, so I would kindly ask you to keep your mics um, muted so we can hear well. Also, depending on the camera, how depending on your network. Um, uh, now we will have uh, more or less uh, 28 minutes, 28 minutes, 25 minutes uh, for the presentation from Greg then there will be space for questions. So please also do write your questions in the chat. In the meanwhile, I will read them loud. If we have time and uh, depending um, on also how many we are, uh, we can, you can raise a question after. So we will have 10 minutes for questions and answers, of course. And then I'll try to wrap up at the end, um, take the key messages, uh, at least from my perspective. And uh, by 10, by 11.45, uh, we will finish our session, our meeting. And with this, I give you floor, Greg. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katerina. So um, I will be talking about what the EID can offer cities uh, when it comes to climate adaptation. So I have divided my presentation in two parts. One part is more general about what the EIB does and how we do it. But then the second part, I will share with you some of really interesting examples of projects that have interesting adaptation components in them. Um, so just to start, um, this is the slide that shows our lending statistics. So you can see that um, our lending to the cities is about one third of our activity. When I say lending to cities, it doesn't necessarily need to mean that, um, that the projects are all loans to municipalities. These could be loans to municipal companies as well, or th there could be private loans to projects that have a very important urban development component. So about one third of our lending is related to, to the cities, actually. And um, given our uh, large activity, we are actually quite an important lender to the urban sector uh, in Europe. And Europe is our main market. As you can see on the other 
uh, chart, we land both in the EU and outside of the EU, but our activity outside of the EU is pretty small. It's about one tenth of what we do within the EU. Now, um, we have a couple of core markets, as you can see on the slide, uh, on, the, on the chart on the left hand side in the bottom. So the old uh, EU member states, so to say, are our biggest borrowers. And we would like to very much to rebalance this, uh, this chart and increase our activities in the countries of uh, the East and of the South of the European Union so that we can, we can have much more balanced distribution of our activities. And the last one is a sectoral split. As you can see, our sectoral split is actually quite uh, balanced and we tar target all sectors of the urban economy in quite a nice and balanced distribution. And we are very happy with that. So if we can go next, please go next to the next slide, yes. So out of our lending to the urban uh, projects, we calculate that the climate action. And the climate action for the EIB is the share of the project that is directly related to climate. And we have two components of our climate action, climate mitigation, so all kinds of energy efficiency investments, and climate adaptation, which is the topic of the discussion today. So as you can see, uh, nearly half in recent years of our urban lending is climate related. And we are very happy with that because climate adaptation is one of the most important measures, EIB activities uh, in general. I think this is the single one most important measure that we are um, reporting to our shareholders. Then, um, if you look at the composition of our climate activity, you can see that adaptation is a very narrow uh, part of it. Why is that? The reason is that we have to make sure that we report only additional expenditures that we can attribute to adaptation. So we have to be able to understand how much more we have lent to a city uh, to include adaptation components in the project in comparison to another just been doing business as usual. I think that somebody is unmuted and there is a bit of a background noise. Please mute yourself. But continuing this, so um, we can only show additional costs related to adaptation in order to claim that we are lending for climate action specific. That is why this uh, share is pretty small in our statistics. But what we know is that cities do adaptation pretty much in every project uh, that we are financing. But very often adaptation measures are basically designed differently. I mean, projects can be designed with climate adaptation in mind and they can still cost as much as projects without the climate adaptation components. It's just better design what makes the whole difference. Sometimes even, and I will show you an example of this type of thinking, projects can actually be cheaper if adaptation is treated correctly. When, when people treat nature as a factor in urban economy, not as a threat, then the projects can be designed even more cost, uh, more cost efficiently than in normal circumstances. But this will, be, this will be shown later. So can we go to the next one, please? Right, so when we work with municipalities, these are the four main products that we offer. We offer a typical investment loan, and it is our main product, um, which basically is a, is a loan to finance an investment program. This is a uh, product that we have been offering since our beginning. There is another product that we are using very often in our work with cities, which is a framework loan. And the framework loan is a very good product for cities because it can finance entire medium term 
investment program of the city. We can uh, agree to lend to a city based on a framework loan, even if certain components of the city's investment plan are still unknown. We can then include those components during the implementation. So very many cities in our uh, portfolio use framework loans. And this is the product that we are very interested in offering uh, to cities because it is easy both for the city and both for us uh, to implement. Now we have two other programs uh, that we use for smaller cities. It's a program loan or inter on intermediated lending. Program loan is basically a program of loans where we can approve as one package and then we can sign individual loans with group of municipalities. And this is something that we use to work with a, with a group of similar smaller municipalities. And intermediated lending is when we lend for an inter intermediary. And very often, this would be a national promotional bank operating in a certain country where we can use this uh, institution's network and capabilities to uh, 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 reach smaller municipalities. And then through that institution, we would provide this loan. Our important uh, goal is also to crowd in other financiers. So we have the strict policy of lending up to 50% of the project investment cost. However, for climate adaptation components, but also for climate mitigation components, we can lend up to 75%. And this is actually a very important incentive which pushes our client to include as many of climate investments into the programs as possible. And it works quite well, I have to say, and you have seen in our chart statistics before that the share of climate related investments is growing in our portfolio. So let's, all right. Now can we move to the next slide, please? Yes. So, um, in order to properly manage the issue of climate adaptation, we have quite a strong uh, system of analyzing this aspect. And uh, it all starts with climate risk assessment. And for every single operation, it's actually part of our policy right now, we assess climate risks and we have a standardized tool and standardized reporting on this topic. And then, once we've done it, we assess components that contribute to climate action. Now, um, we have two ways of looking at the components that are related to climate adaptation. The most uh, detailed one and most correct one is based on the data supplied by the client. When the client can demonstrate which components are climate adaptation ones, we can use them as a proxy to what adaptation measures are really um, what is the value of those adaptation measures that are included in the project. But sometimes we have uh, a bit of a more difficult situation, especially with our framework loans, where the investment programs are not fully defined yet. So here we use proxy approach, where we have analyzed in the past typical municipal investment programs uh, based on the policy and the commitment of certain cities, and we derive um, proxy numbers that we use for future operations. So we have these two approaches. We prefer, obviously, to, to, to operate on the real data supplied by the client. But if it is not possible, um, we are using the proxy approach. So um, this is how these numbers that I have shown earlier have actually come up. So, so this is very little that we can show in terms of real additional costs that are related to adaptation. But let's move to the next slide we will be able to discuss a little bit of, of this in a detail. So when we talk about climate adaptation, for us, adaptation cannot really be looked at in isolation. For us, adaptation has linkages to all other important elements of what is happening in today's economy. So very important element that has linkages to climate adaptation is everything related to air quality. And when cities work on air quality, they work on adaptation at the same time. Um, then we have EU, EU taxonomy, which is a very important tool, a policy tool, um, 
that drives people's activities and um, you know it requires that the decisions are taken that would lead to adaptation measures being part of every single project and then there was this natural capital investment facility that had been established uh, by the EU it is now merging into the invest EU actually but in the past it has shown that bringing natural solutions to municipal investments is also climate adaptation so by putting all those linkages together we are really doing a lot of climate adaptation even if it is not called climate adaptation uh, but it really is climate adaptation so let's go to certain examples can we go to the next slide please yeah so here are an ex some examples of our clients that do climate adaptation. And, um, you know, if you look at this, all these projects are very different, really. Um, sometimes they are just as simple as in Barcelona, where the city is just locating buildings based on prevailing winds and um, the path of the sun in order to naturally provide buildings with ventilation so that they don't overheat uh during summer during summer days okay it can be as simple as that but it's very efficient actually it's using a natural solution also it's air and the sun uh, to deal with important uh, problems that otherwise would be faced by the residents right then in paris again this is an example where air quality have been the the goal of the city but actually it was a climate adaptation project well same thing in rotterdam right um if you have a coastal coastal city that wants to manage water differently uh, well you can use natural solutions that uh, would break the paved uh, surfaces in order to make the, the water uh, to be absorbed by by the natural uh, ground you know specially made ponds and and this is this is a very good uh, solution to manage the climate related risks and it's also climate adaptation project and and um, yeah, this is what we this is what we do with our cities, and this uh, very often doesn't really cost anything. It just change in the way the cities think. That is why it's very important that we can exchange the exam uh, the experience and uh, show examples of those projects in order to, um, to, to 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 show what can be done, you know, and bring some kind of inspiration to others how things can be done differently. Um, I don't have it here on that slide, but um, um, we also see climate adaptation very often built in uh, building construction, doing uh, green roofs, which provide for better insulation that reduce urban heat island, but also help the city to manage the rainwater, especially as um, the, the, the rain storms are becoming much more uh, common in today's uh, new climate uh, reality. Well, the, the green roofs be, have become in some cities a norm, actually. So it's no longer a new thing to bring a green roof to a, to a project. This is now a standard way of doing things in certain cities. And I think it should become standard everywhere. So if we go to the next slide, that is an example that I wanted to show you of uh, well, this is actually, it's a project that had been analyzed in one of our client cities. It's actually Gothenburg in Sweden. This is a study that had been done by a consortium of uh, local universities and other research institutions, which shown a little bit um, the different way of thinking when it comes to climate adaptation. The city hasn't yet decided of, on what it will do, but whatever they will do, it will be financed by a framework loan Gothenburg has with us. So here, you know, uh, if you look at different options, you know, the retreat option basically means you move away from the sea because you are afraid that the sea level will rise. The fan option means you will actually build up all those flood protection walls in order to protect what you build. And then you can build uh, dens because you know that your area here is protected, but that solution is costly. The attack strategy is something that I found most interesting. It basically says, 
well, we know that there is going to be a flood maybe in 50 years. So let's design our district in such a way that it can be flooded once in a while. You know, if we can make our, our ground floors, uh, you know, garages or warehouses or whatever that can be uh, emptied and can be flooded and after the flood it can be cleaned up and be painted, then we have a city that is fully resilient to our uh, climate risks. And at the same time, it doesn't cost any money. It's a, it's a solution that is entirely based on better design. And I'm really counting on the city to develop this solution this way, because it seems such a, such a new and interesting way of thinking. Now, to conclude my uh, presentation, if you can go to the next slide, please. I would like to show you a project that we do far away from Europe. We actually do it in Mongolia. And it's a project that we are doing in collaboration with uh, ADB, Asian Development Bank, EU, and also Green Climate Fund. This project is entirely focused on climate adaptation. In Mongolia, due to climate change, there has been a very important change in the way local farming works. The farmers reacted to climate change, which basically meant for them a much higher mortality of their livestock, which is sheep, by increasing uh, the sizes of their uh, sheep herds. This all led to overgrazing, and it actually increased um, the emission of the CO2 because the land started desertifying. So the climate change became like a vicious circle. People reacted to the climate change by doing activities which would have even more climate change. So here, the idea is to reverse that situation. And we are putting together with all these institutions uh, $735 million in order to create a completely new, green, resilient, and sustainable way of doing farming in Western Mongolia that would involve uh, both urban and rural economies. And uh, it will create a lot of SMEs and cooperatives, but also self-regulation. The people will control each other, uh, how many sheep each of them have, so that they can um, make sure that the, the, the fields will not be overgrazed and the vegetation can come back. If, it, if we are successful, we will uh, bring back to the soil 100 million tons of CO2, which is like closing a medium-sized coal-fired power plant. It's amazing change for that part of the world. Now, it can only be possible if we build urban infrastructure so that all these economic activities that are necessary can be possible. And this is what EAB finances, but we can, un we can understand that we finance this urban infrastructure as part of the, this really big climate adaptation project. It's amazing how these linkages are present in a country uh, with very peculiar climate and economic um, situation like Mongolia. And we are really hoping that we will be successful. Um, it looks like uh, the, the government is fully committed to it. And uh, we will be observing over the next 10 years how this is all happening. So this is an example from far away, which I wanted to show you what are the things that can be done if there is a need and the situation requires uh, assistance. Yeah, I lost a bit of connection at the moment. Everything has been frozen. Well, okay. You go um, ahead. Do you hear me now? Now it's okay. Mm -hmm. Is it okay now? Good, okay. Very good. So the last thing which, uh, which is important uh, to, to, to explain outside of what we do in terms of investment, there's also an important element of advisory. And we have created a advisory product, especially directed to cities, which we call Urbis, 
and it is implemented by the European Investment Advisory Hub and financed by the European Union. And this program offers assistance to cities um, on any topic. So uh, if it is climate adaptation, it will be a fantastic topic for us to use Urbis in order to help the city prepare uh, the project. Um, this is very diverse. We can finance all kind of um, uh, advisory activities that cities require in order to bring their program or project to a state that, you know, in which it can be financed. So Urbis is, is a very good tool. It is now becoming also part of the invest EU, but it will still be delivered by the European Investment Advisory Hub, which is located in the EAB. So that is it. This is uh, everything I wanted to present today. And uh, if there is any uh, question or somebody would like to discuss some topics, I'm very happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, I wrote down like many questions and I'm also happy to hear, uh, to see that people do ask. So maybe I start raising it um, and then let's see if we can, um, yeah, maybe have, uh, because we do have time. So maybe people can um, ask. Um, so question from uh, Walters. Would it be nice to see the lending amounts per capita per country? Otherwise, it's hard to compare. Uh, would you have data per, like the graphs that you showed, like, or is it possible to see it somewhere on the EIB website or in a report? So we publish this data for our operations as a whole. So our lending per capita is one of our standard reporting. However, when it comes to the urban lending data, we would need to prepare this data specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay. From Andy, uh, is it possible to make your risk assessment tools, analysis and modeling available also to city administrations? So kind of, if I understand right, like also like maybe a, if you develop a toolkit, but uh, maybe I go further than the question. Like something that would with well, autonomy, uh, yeah. Well, I guess that, um... As a bank, we probably wouldn't like to share our risk management uh, techniques with our clients so that we can be sure that, uh, you know, information that we get from our clients is not engineered towards specific tools. But um, if there is a need to, to develop certain tools, Urbis is a perfect tool to do it, actually. So if there is any, any idea of developing risk management tools for climate risks, this would be perfect. To, to enter into collaboration with us. Hmm. Yeah, I also wonder like if this tool, then if it's developed under the Urbis, like if it could serve the um, uh, city administrations, like uh, that they would be uh, able to be more autonomous and putting with their data, having their analysis. So let's see, it's maybe more complex than that, right? When you have something like which is like one size fits all, it may then lose a bit of its sharpness. So we have to be careful with that. Yeah, I wonder about the cost a bit, but okay. Uh, Urbis is there, um, and it will be there also under the InvestEU. Now, question from Elena: What kind of tools and models are being used to assess risk and inform most effective investments? Do some of these also incorporate nature-based solutions as adaptation solutions? So tools and models uh, to assess risk and inform really about the most in effective investments. I would add my question on really this advisory um, because I can imagine that the municipality, especially smaller municipalities, they might not have such a capacity to really uh, assess the project from all the adaptation perspective to incorporate the, the nature-based solutions because you mentioned Barcelona, Paris, big cities. So if we talk about smaller town, would you as the bank uh, assess or advise actually the project also with, uh, with a pair of eyes of adaptation and actually maybe change the project? So because you also mentioned that it could become even cheaper or maybe more expensive in a way that, okay, green roofs uh, are on. Uh, so 
the municipality would then decide if to go for nature-based solutions, but could you provide such assessment, such advisory? So uh, let me answer this way. So obviously we are a bank, so we would look at projects designed by our clients and we will not really design projects for the clients. So it has to be the client who is responsible to, 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 to actually understand what they want and design what they really think is the best for them. And then our job is to appraise it, assess it, uh, assess the risks of it. And then if we find the project is good, we finance. I think that uh, this has to be kept like this because it's the right balance of responsibility. But now when it comes to preparation of projects, especially on the climate adaptation side, what we have seen many countries actually provided on the, from the central government through various institutions, assistance to cities in order to prepare the climate resilient strategies and to help them prepare projects. So I think this assistance is actually available either directly from the central government or through associations of municipalities. I would be very surprised that uh, there will be a situation that this assistance is not available, especially that EU has put so much assistance in terms of monetary resources uh, to those governments in order to help cities prepare those projects. But okay, if there is a situation that somebody is missing something, then of course Urbis is here to, to fill that gap. Yeah, so I can compliment on that, uh, that uh, this support should be also uh, embedded in, um, in the support from structural funds, so the, the ERDA, the European Regional Development Fund. Um, there should be such support, such know-how. Uh, there is much more emphasis on climate proofing. So now I talk more about infrastructure, but um, the green infrastructure, blue infrastructure in partnership agreements, also in the operational programs. And um, yeah, so there should be such an such advisory. There is the, the condition of uh, enabling condition uh, in negotiation, but also uh, the, the climate proofing that is uh, now the standard, let's say. So it's also building up uh, on the expertise from Jaspers. Then of course we have under the InvestEU, we will have the advisory hub. So now it will not be, it will be like all in one advisory hub um, of the InvestEU. So the Urbis, Jaspers, Elena, also on mitigation. So it goes to one, uh, one advisory. Also from the NCFF that uh, Greg mentioned, the Nature Capital Financing Facility, that we are finishing uh, this pilot and uh, the, this fund will be also moved under the InvestEU and there will be special, special advisory on adaptation and, uh, and biodiversity. So this is an, uh, yeah. So InvestEU in this sense is an opportunity to really, if you present, if the municipality city presents the project under the InvestEU, there will be such advisory because there, there will be advisory of a grant, let's say, uh, especially like, uh, the, for, yeah, I don't want to go into numbers, but the NCFF, uh, the advisory, we understood that from the pilot, actually what made the fund um, uh, a success, let's say, even if we see that it, it is challenging, that's why we want to join forces and rather see adaptation everywhere in all projects and not exclusively adaptation projects. So we see that the advisory was uh, the essential component for municipalities to, to go uh, for a loan under the NCFF. So we are aware of it and there is lots of emphasis on the advisory. Um, then I have a question from Nicola. Do you provide climate risk assessment or you also support municipalities in understanding the financial risk of borrowing, for instance, in relation to city budget, overall revenues and long-term budgeting? Hmm, very good question. Yeah, I think this is actually a very good question, but I have to say we don't really go that far. We wouldn't be able to give an assessment of the city with, uh, with uh, budgetary implications of um, issues in management of climate risks. I think that our management of climate risks is more, um, is actually simpler than that, but uh, we have certain thresholds. And if the city is considered to be too risky from the climate uh, point of view, we just wouldn't work with, with a city. We would just uh, turn down an application if we see that the climate risks are not properly managed. So again, those assessments are internal. Um, if the city would like to manage their risks better, 
we would advise the city to actually contract a proper climate risk advisory, which again can be done under URBIS or can be contracted by the city themselves. And of course, this should be done. Um, what I have seen really, it, it's very imp important to, to, to note this, when cities have well-defined climate adaptation strategies, and then the strategies are being used in project design, it leads to much better projects. I mean, they don't cost more money; they just they are just better. And uh, and and then the, the people living there, they really see the difference, and they are really appreciating that. So I can only uh, ask the cities and uh, plead to, to 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 the city's management to actually treat this seriously and uh, spend money on, on doing this. Hmm. Here I can add uh, the importance of SECAPS, uh, of the Sustainable uh, Climate uh, and, uh, the Energy and Adaptation Plans, um, which was mentioned during the whole morning, uh, really to have the strategy, have the vision. Um, also, I would like to mention a new, new fund, new policy support facility. Uh, that will be launched this year, and it's to support more or less 100 uh, cities, small and medium-sized cities um, uh, in development and implementation, but moreover, implementation really moving to action under the SECAPS. Uh, so it will be uh, managed by the Covenant of Mayors, and we are now preparing it. So it should be announced in autumn 2021. And because we do understand that also the needs of smaller cities or medium-sized cities. And uh, then I go to the next question um, from Katarzyna. Uh, could you comment on the unique value of the EIB lending to public authorities in the current low interest rate environment? Kasia, many thanks for this question because I asked this question to Greg <laughs> during our prep meeting. <laughs> But I said I'll be nice during the session. <laughs> so yes, Kasia, I, uh, she comes from Poland. Just uh, so you are I, welcome. <laughs> I had the same question. <laughs> Please go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, it's actually a very interesting question. But what I can say is that um, indeed uh, it's a very low interest rate environment. So it's not about making lending cheaper. It's about make, making lending better. And I think that uh, at least what I can see, okay, I'm here on the, on the lending side, I cannot speak for our borrower, but what I can say is that uh, many borrowers value working with the EIB due to our flexibility, due to the fact that we can really understand uh, the, you know, the nature of the project. And we put a lot of effort in uh, understanding the project and making sure that um, our financing is actually um, fully uh, designed to meet the project specific characteristics. So I think this is really important. When I mentioned framework loan, this is a product that our clients value a lot because it, it matches the way the cities work. Uh, it matches their approval calendars for the investment programs. So, so they are happy to use it really. And, uh, and I think it has been quite successful. So yeah. I guess there is value. We, we definitely see it because clients are coming to us and they are happy to work with us. Um, despite the fact that, as I said, we are quite diligent. So it actually means that uh, we are not lending very rapidly. We take time to understand the nature of the project. But I think our municipal clients are, are actually appreciating that. They treat us as a partner. Um, they value our advice, and very often when we, when we structure financing, we can we can see certain elements that can be done better, and then we can advise on it, and and then you know the, the client can take that advice and, and improve the program. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but when it happens, it, it's really a value. So yeah, I guess this is this would be my answer, to be frank. Thank you. And uh, I go to the last question from Elena. And it's about the advisory. So do you have an equivalent of Urbis, but for regions? So for instance, Regis, because for adaptation um, uh, in, in the field of agriculture and forestry, uh, these will be also very affected sectors. So also like at regional level. 
the advisory and also in a talk el earlier this morning because we had several sessions on adaptation. Uh, the issue was raised on the role of the EIB, we mentioned to you um, as an investor, for instance, with equity stakes. Uh, we also mentioned like uh, social bonds, green bonds, uh, to actually help develop markets. Uh, Elena, this is an excellent question because to me, it's like mitigation markets 20 years ago, and now we are with adaptation markets and it's everywhere and we still need to develop it. And EIB to us, yes, you are the partner. We also want to work with you on the missions. So actually, as Elena is saying, that adaptation will always be much, much more challenging than mitigation initially. I think it's about the behavioral change and uh, also getting the concept of adaptation as such, but at the moment, yeah, it's a big question to me also, like, uh, we need to create this new market. So, okay, I got yeah. less of it in the questions, but please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so just to answer maybe the first one on regional and agri, well, there are two other uh, technical units that are responsible for regional projects and for agri projects. So I'm not sure exactly what type of advisory products they offer. All right, I am really here in the urban sphere and maybe I should just talk about the urban. But I have to say that uh, when I look at what my colleagues do from those two other divisions, they are very active and collaborating with clients on their respective sectors as, as strongly as we do. So I'm sure they have, uh, they have a lot of to offer. Now, when it comes to our role as an as a investor, um, yeah, I think, okay, we, we do invest in investment funds. And we do provide equity and quasi equity and also other investment uh, products to our clients, depending on the sector and depending on the market. But uh, I think that we are, I think what the value really is of the EIB is in provision of um, very attractively priced and very long-term funds. And um, especially for infrastructure type investments, we we do understand this and we we work with this a lot and i think this is where we are the best at least this is in the urban sector okay maybe in other sectors this would be a, a bit different i understand that um, we are very strong uh, in like life science sectors where we don't really offer long-term loans we, we go with much more advanced finance uh, financing products because this is the sector that it requires but when it comes to urban sector Really, the bulk of our activities by provision of long term, uh, attractively priced and flexible finance. So, so I guess this is this is gonna remain, and uh, and we are happy to to have it like this. Now, when it comes to more advanced products that are very much linked to financing, with climate mitigation, well, you can count your CO two savings, and uh, this makes it so much easier to finance with adaptation you don't really count the co2 so you know it's all much more qualitative and building something around it is actually much more difficult of course we, and we are trying we are um we have now this climate awareness bonds but we also have sustainability awareness bonds we try to capture in certain ways uh benefits of uh, circular economy projects, of socially oriented projects, and of uh, adaptation projects. So, so this is something new that we do. Um, we cannot really say if it's going to work very well or not, but, but we are really trying to see what is possible in this area. I think we will generally be looking into possibilities to, to direct our financing more closely towards climate. As I mentioned previously, this is our paramount goal. We are in the end, we want to be called European Union's Green Bank. And I think we treat this uh, name very seriously. But at the same time, I have to say, uh, it's, not, it's not obvious how it will be achieved. Um, and we have to also respond to the needs of the clients and uh, prov provide them with what they really need from us. Um, so maybe we should also in include in our discussion the role of an advisory. I think it's actually very important, especially in adaptation, because I think one lesson that we can really draw today is that adaptation is present practically in every project we do. Sometimes it is so well included in the project design that there is not a single name of 
adaptation mentioned in this document, but the project itself is very strong. I have to say the stronger the, the best clients of us, they just do it because they, they need to do it, they understand and it's important today and, and they don't really go and talk about it, they just do it and, uh, and we are very happy to find an answer. So um, maybe just to, 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 to kind of wrap up a little bit of what I said is that um, we really see a very big potential from exchange between, between our clients. And uh, by showing examples that would inspire others to do things in a, in a better way, I think this is really what uh, what EIB is all about, and uh, and and we do we do it and we enjoy it very much. Mm. Thank you very much, Greg. So to me, uh, it's a, it's also the wrap up of the three messages: one that adaptation is it somewhere or is it everywhere? And I think today we we I agree that it is everywhere and that it's really an integral part of all investment projects, or at least it should be the integral part of our projects. Uh, I'm glad that I learned about the loans that you do have. Uh, you finance uh, up to 75 percent of the project if there are adaptation measures. So I find it a good incentive, like concrete, uh, concrete incentive. And of course, uh, the advisory. So I think that we all agree that the advisory and the, the, the like the second point is the value of the EIB um, on the advisory, on the loans, on the credibility. And I'm also glad that you mentioned the EU taxonomy, the importance of really uh, having also the legislation and uh, the vision and what we want uh, uh, as investment yeah. or what kind of invest uh, investment we want in Europe. So it is clear that we need to create new markets. It's a very challenging uh, <laughs> task. Uh, it's a big societal transformation. So I leave it here because uh, it, there is no way to, to really have answer to creating a market uh, for adaptation investments. I thank you very much, Greg, uh, for this time that you replied to all our uh, uh, questions. I thank very much to all participants because uh, I am really amazed by your questions and thank you so much because that made it a, a real discussion and debate. And uh, I thank to to Nancy also for uh, the technical advice uh, for the technical support with the presentation and to the whole team that is behind this investment forum. So we could actually be here today and uh, and listen to this success story and uh, have this time and space together. Thank you very much. I also invite you to a live session in the afternoon. We have networking, so we have a lunch break, but there are sessions in the afternoon. Please take the opportunity to meet people. I know it's online, it's different, uh, and yet it's an opportunity. And we will also have a session on live because one of the subcategories will be uh, in future live call will be on uh, adaptation and mitigation. So thank you very much and uh, wish you a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.